Uh, I was uh, doing a uh, date in New York, my first record date, as a matter of fact, at A&R Recording Studios on 48th Street. And uh, uh, Phil Ramon and uh, David Green. David Green was the engineer, and Phil Ramon had done a lot of work with me prior to that, uh, both from a record standpoint and also in the jingle area. I did a lot of uh, it was the business I was in at that time. And uh, I joined in New York at uh, Phil's and Dave's uh, request, I guess you might say. And uh, Dave and I have been involved in various projects for a number of years. And uh, I bump into Phil now and again. Actually, we, well, we established Nimb Nimbus 9 in 68. Uh, but we actually built the studio and... Uh, uh, soundstage, uh, we built that, it opened in 72. So it was a period of four years where we didn't have any facilities and we decided that uh, we needed and the country needed a state-of-the-art facility and that's when we uh, made the decision to go with, uh, with uh, the construction of uh, the soundstage. It's an interesting thing. Uh, on that situation with the soundstage, we pick we, we picked the name. We actually bought a, a film post production company called Telecraft, and along with that uh, purchase came a film producer's license, which at that time enabled you to bring in any equipment duty free, and uh, so uh, we brought in a great deal of our equipment, pretty well all of it. And we got it all in the studio and everything operating. We got a call from Excise and et cetera saying that they wanted to come down and see the facility. And uh, uh, we were sort of pretty concerned. <laughs> and uh, I went out and got a 16 millimeter Mitchell camera and brought it in and set it up in the corner of the studio. And in waltzed this guy and uh, we're all set. Everybody's all tensed up. And he said, uh, 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 I want to see the Eventide Clockworks. And I'm figuring, what, what does he want to see the Eventide Clockworks for? I took him over and showed him, told him what it does. The, the, the cl word clockworks in there put it outside of what they felt was in the film producer's uh, 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 license on that basis. That's all he wanted to see, and I'll tell you, when he left, there was a big sigh of relief from everyone. These eyes started, well, we did one session here in Toronto initially. The first session after uh, I decided I would leave McCann Erickson, I was radio TV director and account executive on the Coca-Cola account there for about eight years. And I decided to leave because I had been doing work with a lot of Canadian artists, Jack London, David Clayton Thomas and the Shays, and uh, just a bunch of them. And there was such a tremendous pool of talent, no one knew who they were. And we decided that we would take a flyer and uh, see if we couldn't do something about that. So I left McCann and uh, talked to the Guess Who, who decided, said that they would decide they would come with us. And I also talked to the Staccatos and they stayed with Capital. And we bought the Guess Who's contract out from Quality Records for $1,000. And uh, they said they got, to keep, they got to keep the old masters. I said, I don't want the old masters. So uh, we did the first session, which we did at Hallmark. And when I brought it back to the office and listened to it, I was not happy with it at all. And I told my partners, I said, you know, I said, I really want to redo this stuff. And, of course, they were looking saying, gee, but we paid this much money for it, you know. And in the meantime, the group had decided pretty much the same thing. They were unhappy. And they flew into Toronto. We got together, and the first thing I said was, guys, I want to scrap the session. I want to redo it again. And they said, oh, that's, that's why we came down. Oh, wonderful. So it actually started the relationship up. We, we redid those three recordings of, of a dropping pin, uh, Guess Who Blues, I can't remember what the other one was. And uh, we went through an, uh, a uh, independent distributor, which was a disaster. 
and we finally decided that we would sort of go for broke. And uh, I called Phil, and uh, Phil said, sure, come on down. And we decided we would take them to New York and do an album. And when we got, uh, when we got to New York, I'd hoped to be doing, doing it in A1, which was their big studio at, uh, at A&R. And he said, we can't do it there. There's someone in there, but we've got a brand new studio. No one's been in it. And I found out, well, the only thing that had been done in there was a demo by Ravi Shankar. And, but uh, Phil said, look, use it. If it works, pay for it. If it doesn't work, don't pay for it. I figured, well, it wasn't, you couldn't lose too much on that. But he couldn't do the session, so he recommended Dave Green to me. And uh, we started the session on a Monday morning, and we were actually uh, cutting lacquers on Saturday afternoon. We had a sweetening session on Saturday morning with, with the strings and the, the horns. And uh, funny thing there, when the, when the original arrangement put together the uh, Ben McPeak who did the charts, had timpanis in there, was it these eyes, boom, boom, and I listened to it, I said, Ben, that just does not work at all. And they had a vibraphone in the studio, and I asked the percussionist, I said, you don't happen to play vibes, do you? He said, yeah. I said, do the part on vibes, so it's dum dum, ding, ding, you know, you just hear it very softly in the background. But anyway, it went on to be a massive record, and it was the start of their career, and of course, also the start of ours. One of our other producers, Bob Ezrin, did Bing Floyd, and he also did the, the Peter Gabriel album. I didn't do that as well. Part of the wall was recorded there. A lot of the guitar overdubs were recorded there. Uh, the Salisbury Hill album was recorded there entirely. It was Peter's first album as a solo artist. And oh, uh, we had Dr. John in there. He did his album there as well. I had uh, Neil Young did some stuff there. Uh, 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 Ringo Starr did some stuff there. Uh, we had a pretty impressive uh, parade of uh, major artists go through the studio. Uh, primarily, I like to think anyway, <laughs> because we turned out very good product. And uh, uh, it was fairly isolated. There were certain tax benefits to some of the international artists because of uh, the recording being done in Canada. Well, I guess the highlight probably is when American Woman went number one. <laughs> I know they had to sort of pour me out from under the console that night. Uh, we were doing it in the middle of the session when we found that one out. Uh, but uh, there are other things that are equally as memorable, not necessarily as fluid as that one was. But uh, I had some sessions with Poco that are very memorable and some material that I did with them that I'm really quite, quite proud of. Uh, Crazy Eyes and Magnolia. Uh, uh, the Seeger situation was a little bit different. Uh, when we did the Seeger situation, Bob had sort of been trying to get in touch with me to do something. We never clicked. I had one occasion, I almost, and we didn't click, and I got this call well, I got home from a date, and my wife says, you're supposed to be in Memphis. I said, no, I'm not. And uh, he said, we said he, he, he wants you there. I said, I don't care. I'm not. I just got off sessions for, I guess it was about almost three months. And uh, then eventually, Punch Andrews called again, and we were going to do uh, four sides. And uh, I was going to fly to Detroit and do pre-production, and every time I got to fly to Detroit to do pre-production, they called and canceled it. Then we get a call that he's coming in. And I got to get my engineer, Brian Christian, I flew him off from LA. And we get in and he comes in with two songs. Uh, I still have them, they, had, they were never released. Uh, and uh, we did the two songs. And I said, you know, well, do we need, need, need a couple more songs, Bob? So we looked at and we decided we'd do My World is Empty Without You, Babe, and The Supremes, which we put together. And I said, we still need another song. And Bob was in my office noodling on the piano, and he was playing something. I said, that sounds really interesting. He said, oh, he says, it's not ready, it's not done. 
I said, well, just, just play it again, will you? And I said, look, I said, I think it's, it's got the potential to be a great track. Uh, let's do it. So in the meantime, I'd sent his keyboard player back to Detroit, his guitar player back to Detroit. So I actually got back in, and we set it up, and I got Doug Riley to come in, and uh, Joey Michelon on guitar. And we actually put night moves together in the studio uh, from his very, very rough version of it on my piano in my office. And... Uh, the irony of it there is that when we finished it, and uh, uh, it was, I gave it back to Punch Andrews. I guess they sent it to sent one to Capitol, and we didn't hear anything. They didn't like it apparently. So I said, "Oh well, you, you know, you win some, you lose some." And uh, they had a uh, John Carter was the A and R at Capitol in L.A. at that time, and he came up to Toronto to see Capital up here, and we were pretty tight with Capital. Arnold Gosowitz is a good friend of mine. And they used to bring them down to the studio when they brought VPs in. And, and of course, John comes in, and I cornered him, and I said, I gather you didn't like uh, the, the uh, Seeger stuff. And you, <laughs> when you hit an A&R guy like that, you know, it's sort of hum, ha, ah, et cetera. They try to avoid everything they possibly can. And I said, no, no, I said, I'm just interested. He says, well, he said, both tracks were, were okay. I said, what do you mean both tracks? He said, well, we got the two tracks. I said, well, I did four. What did you hear? And he gave me the two songs that Bob had brought in, which were, they were wrong key, and he wouldn't change the key. And so I said, well, did you want to hear the other two? And he said, yeah. I played him Night Moves, and then he says, he says, Night Moves is, is just great. I said, yeah, and he said, you cut here, and you cut here, and you got three minutes and 35 seconds. And uh, that was the last I heard of it. And I was in New York doing the Brecker Brothers over the holiday, and I opened Billboard, and there's Night Moves, I think it was 9 or 10, no, at least 90 or, or 91, uh, produced by Punch Andrews. So I got on the phone to Capitol and got to hold of John Carter, and we did the usual, you know, we get together here, get to my girl, call your girl, etc. And I said, John, you got tw 24 hours to get those credits changed on that record, which he did, and needless to say, it uh, became a monster.